Kia ora and welcome to this week's session of the Leukaemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand Winter Spring Webinar Series. Today's session is on indolent B-cell lymphomas with Dr Alana Kilfoyle. My name is Sally Black and I'm the Senior Support Services Coordinator based in Wellington and covering the Lower North Island, so we call that our central region. Um, and before I introduce you to our guest speaker properly, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are recording this session, so it will be available post-event on our YouTube channel, and the easiest way to access that is through our website, which is leukemia.org.nz. So that's just leukemia.org.nz. And also a reminder that you're able to ask questions during this presentation, and in fact, we encourage you to do so. There's a Q&A button along the bottom of the screen. So if you click on that, you can type in your questions. I'll be able to read those to Dr. Kilfoyle at the end of the presentation and hopefully get some answers for you. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Alana Kilfoyle today. She is a haematologist based in Palmerston North with a special interest in lymphoma. She graduated from Auckland University Medical School and undertook her FRACP in FRCPA training in Auckland and the Waikato. Dr. Kilfoyle is now working part-time for MedLab Central as a laboratory haematologist and at MidCentral DHB as a clinical haematologist. So thank you so much, Alana, for being with us today and I will now hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sally. So um, greetings from the sunny uh, city of Palmerston North and it's, it's always sunny and nice down here. So hopefully the rest of you are also uh, enjoying some nice weather. I'm just gonna share my screen. So hopefully that's worked out all right for everyone and you can see what I'm seeing. And um, what we're going to do is just go through uh, an outline of the talk. Um, I'm gonna start by just uh, talking about lymphoma. Uh, then talk about low grade versus high grade lymphoma. Talk about how, about how we diagnose lymphoma, how we stage it, how we treat it, uh, and then um, uh, look at talking about what the future might bring. And I think the future is very bright in this condition. So let's just backtrack to make certain that as we talk about lymphoma, everyone's um, on the same uh, page and understanding of, of lymphoma. So, um, Lymphoma is a cancer and it develops in uh, the lymphatic system and often I think we don't really understand the lymphatic system uh, whilst we've got a good understanding of solid organ cancers because they occur in organs that we're familiar with, bowel, breast, prostate. Sometimes for lymphoma itself we're less familiar with the actual original organ that it comes from. So the lymphatic system is a network of uh, vessels um, and also of nodes, and often nodes get referred to as glands. Uh, and this all forms part of our uh, immune system. So in the green here is the lymphatic uh, vessels, uh, which track along mostly beside the blood vessels um, and uh, a little uh, section of a lymph node here. And often lymph nodes are in quite dense areas in the neck, uh, in the armpits and in the groin, uh, which is why uh, in a physical examination, you'll notice that doctors uh, frequently will uh, be wanting to feel in those areas. Um, the spleen is also considered uh, a slightly larger lymph node really. Uh, and the thymus is also considered part of the uh, lymphatic system as well. And really these are um, a filtering system um, and um, the lymphatic fluid is brought into lymph nodes uh, where they function really as filters uh, or as the police station in order to uh, remove um, bacteria um, uh, from our systems for us to prevent us from getting unwell. And as an organ system, like any other organ system, it can develop a cancer within it. Uh, and, and it's quite complicated because there's a lot of different subtypes of lymphoma and each of them have their own flavors and colors. Um, and if we just simplify the, great, the classification system down, it's separated out into Hodgkin's lymphoma, then into non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And within non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we separate it into low-grade and high-grade lymphomas. And sometimes we will also separate it out on the basis of the cell uh, that it derives from, whether it's a B lymphocyte or a T lymphocyte. And the B uh, 
lymphomas are by far and away more common and more frequent than their T cell cousins. If we then think about what is the grade, the grade really refers to the speed with which the lymphoma will grow. Uh, and low grade lymphomas are sometimes also called indolent lymphomas and they tend to grow at a relatively slow pace. That's uh, in contrast to the high grade lymphomas, which sometimes get referred to as aggressive lymphomas where they grow uh, fast. And there are a number of lymphomas that fall under the low grade category, and I've listed the more common ones here, but there's not an, ex um, an exhaustive list, uh, and also the high grade lymphomas as well. So um, under the low grade lymphomas, there's small lymphocytic lymphoma, uh, which is um, essentially the same uh, condition as chronic lymphocytic lymphoma uh, or leukemia. Uh, with CLL just representing a subtype where we see more of the lymphoma or leukemic cells out in the blood uh, as opposed to in the lymph nodes. Uh, there's marginal zone lymphoma and within marginal zone that can be separated into some further subclassifications of splenic marginal zone and MOLT lymphoma. And the more common of the low grade lymphomas is follicular lymphoma. And follicular lymphoma will be uh, then further classified into grade one, grade two, and grade three. Uh, and that grading system comes from the number of large cells that a pathologist will see under the microscope when they're looking at the biopsy. Um, the high grade lymphomas, and again, I've just mentioned the more common ones here, um, is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and also uh, follicular lymphoma um, grade three B is often uh, pushed into the high grade category rather than staying uh, with the grades one, two, and three A in the low grade category. And there's always those things that aren't going to fit nicely into classification systems. And mantle cell is a lymphoma which can behave uh, with a low grade behavior. It can behave with a very aggressive behavior. Uh, and then it can behave in a sort of standard fashion. So it's, it's the fence sitter in the way it's going to behave. Um, sometimes with mantle cell lymphoma, we can have some idea of whether the mantle cell is going to behave in a low grade uh, fashion or whether it's gonna behave in a more aggressive fashion. And that's sometimes to do with whether or not there's lymph nodes present uh, and sometimes to do with some of the stains that get um, are expressed uh, when we look at the pathology under the microscope. And we will come on to that a little bit more when we talk about diagnosis. Uh, but SOX11 expression being low, having a low key 67 uh, under the microscope uh, is more suggestive that the mantle cell will behave in a low grade fashion uh, where a, a TP53 mutation on genetics uh, or on immunohistochemical stain under the microscope may suggest it's going to behave in a more aggressive uh, behavior. Uh, there's also the rule breakers, um, and um, whilst we have the concept that low-grade lymphomas will grow slowly, uh, sometimes low-grade lymphomas will actually grow quite quickly. Uh, and, and the converse, some high-grade lymphomas actually develop very, very slowly as well. And so sometimes what we find is the way that people have presented isn't necessarily going to be the way that things might look under the microscope. Um, some people with low grade lymphomas can actually transform into a high grade lymphoma and some people uh, will have both lymphomas present uh, at the time of their diagnosis and probably in that situation they have actually started as a low grade lymphoma, been unaware of it and have transformed into a high grade lymphoma, it's a high grade lymphoma with which they're, they're presenting. Often where these latter two have occurred treatment is more geared towards treating the high grade lymphoma uh, with the concept that the low grade gets treated along, uh, alongside uh, the high grade. So in order to diagnose lymphoma, you do need a biopsy and it needs to be an adequate biopsy. Um, if the biopsy is small or if the biopsy is crushed, then that can really impact on the ability of the pathologist to actually make the diagnosis. Uh, and 
sometimes we find that if we haven't got an adequate biopsy and because the classification is so complicated and because treatment is very dependent on the type of lymphoma, we will end up needing to have a repeat biopsy. Um, with a good biopsy, the things that are done with that is the cells are looked at under the microscope by a pathologist. And there's a number of different stains that the pathologist can put on the biopsy material, which will aid in making a diagnosis. And we'll have a look at some of those shortly. And also some of the biopsy can be sent for special tests. And a couple of the special tests that can be done is looking at the, the genetics within the lymphoma cells in the biopsy. Uh, and the other tests that can be sent away for uh, is to look at the surface markers that are expressed on the lymphoma cells. So under the microscope, um, the way the material looks will help make the diagnosis. And um, these are just a couple of um, uh, examples of how things might look under the microscope. Uh, and in follicular lymphoma, what you can see here is that uh, this is sort of made up of tiny dots or pixels, if you like. Uh, and um, in follicular lymphoma, the lymphoma cells will form these nice follicles. Um, and um, it's quite nice having that sort of concept of follicular lymphoma, because these follicles really are what give it its name of follicular lymphoma. Likewise, hairy cell lymphoma gets its name uh, from the little tiny hairy projections that you see on the cells here. So they all look fairly sort of uh, shaggy. Uh, so these are hairy cell lymphomas here. In the background, uh, you can see a white blood cell, a neutrophil, uh, and all these other cells in the background are the red cells. And so this is actually hairy cells present in someone's uh, uh, blood uh, and being looked at under the microscope. You can also do stains. Uh, uh, on the material uh, that you look at under the microscope. Uh, and you can stain um, using a technique that we call immunohistochemistry. And you can pick out certain stains which, which might help you. So we know that CD3 is a marker uh, that is present on T cells. And so if we uh, put a, a stain for CD3 uh, on our material, then the brown stain will attach itself to the T cells. And so what you can then see is we've got this background of uh, brown cells marking up in the background here. And then we've got these areas here where we've got absence uh, of the stain. So what that means is that we've got a background in the background of T cells, but these areas in here are not T cells. Uh, and we can do the same with another stain called CD20. Uh, and the CD20 will latch on and stain onto B cells typically. And again, the same principle is that the brown areas in here are representing where the B cells are in this biopsy. Uh, and the white um, areas of the background will be cells that aren't B cells and that they're not staining for CD20. We can also do a fancy test on biopsy material called surface markers. Uh, and that uh, surface markers is a test of looking at what markers are sitting uh, out on a cell surface. And cells will have um, typical uh, markers on them, and those markers will be different for T cells, and they'll be different for B cells, and they will also be different within some lymphomas as well. So typically we might see a B cell with CD5 expression in someone that has uh, CLL, uh, or small lymphocytic lymphoma or mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, where follicular lymphoma, we may typically see CD10 expressed um, uh, on the B cells. Um, and in order to get this uh, information, you need a fancy uh, analyzer, which is called a flow cytometer. And what happens is the samples get put through the flow cell uh, and they will go past a laser beam. And then you can use uh, fluorescence, uh, which will mark up uh, CD20, uh, perhaps, and CD10. And that allows you to find out whether there's a population of cells that express both CD20 and CD10 at the same time. Um, and that's just another way that we can help uh, make a diagnosis of the different subtypes of uh, lymphoma.
Some lymphomas will have abnormal uh, DNA. They will have acquired mutations. Uh, and that can sometimes help us with the diagnosis because some lymphomas uh, will have a typical abnormality present in their uh, DNA. And um, that is something that might help us make a diagnosis as well. We can look at DNA in different ways in the laboratory. Uh, we can look at chromosomes, uh, which is what this panel here is. And it absolutely amazes me the ability of our laboratory scientists uh, to um, be able to determine which of these relatively grey looking worms is a chromosome 9 versus a chromosome 8 uh, versus, you know, a chromosome 16. Uh, and then with the precision with which they're able to then detect that an abnormality is present. Uh, they do have some computer software that, it, that does help them for that, I understand, but um, uh, these people are, are, are very good at their jobs. Um, and um, it's relatively easy on this um, carrier type here, uh, which is of a man, because it's got a chromosome X and a chromosome Y. Um, we can see here that they've uh, developed a third copy of chromosome 12. Uh, which would be abnormal since you have two copies of each chromosome. Uh, and perhaps what's a little bit more subtle is that you can see that a section of chromosome 18 here has come and joined chromosome 14 here. Uh, so there's been a translocation of genetic material uh, between chromosome 14 and chromosome 18. Um, you can also uh, look at whether a genetic abnormality is present uh, using fluorescent probes, uh, and we call that FISH. Um, and what you can do here is you can put on a probe for uh, one gene here um, with the green and um, with uh, one uh, which is red. Um, and normally, if these are meant to be on separate uh, chromosomes, then um, these signals should be separated as the chromosomes will be in different sections uh, of, the, of the nucleus. Here, what we see is we see the, the green and the red co-located together because those, um, those uh, bits of the DNA from chromosome 11 and 14 have come to reside right next to each other and are giving you this sort of si signal uh, in here. So um, that again is a really useful technique which can be undertaken on biopsy materials, which is helpful in diagnosing some subtypes of lymphoma. So once you've got a answer from the biopsy material of what particular lymphoma uh, is uh, present, the next question that uh, needs to be answered is, well, whereabouts is the lymphoma? And we call that stage. Um, and that's really important because it may alter the way uh, that the lymphoma is treated. And the staging classification is stage one, two, three, and four. Uh, and stage one means that there's one area involvement. Uh, stage two uh, means that there are two areas of involvement, but it's both those areas that are involved are on the same side of the diaphragm. Uh, so. Uh, either both uh, above the diaphragm or both below the diaphragm. In stage three, there are lymph node groups involved on both sides of the diaphragm, both above and below it. And in stage four, the lymphoma has spread outside of the lymph nodes. Uh, and that may be that the lymphoma is within the bone marrow, uh, or it may be that the lymphoma is within the liver uh, or the bowel, um, or uh, even the lung or thyroid. Uh, in order to determine the stage, uh, further investigations uh, need to be undertaken. And um, patients will uh, have a CT scan, um, and that will um, allow the identification that there may be uh, abnormal areas within the scan. Uh, CT scanning does tend to give a black and white image, uh, and so there is a uh, colour version, if you like, of a CT scan, which is called a PET-CT. Uh, and this involves giving an isotope that will be taken up 
uh, by cells that are actively using glucose, uh, which lymphoma cells tend to do. And what you can see here is on the black and white image um, of the CT scan here is that there is a, a lymph node area here that's involved and another little area here that's involved. Uh, but it becomes a lot easier to see once you put the PET uh, imaging on uh, with the fluorescence um, of the isotope being taken up into the lymphoma cells. And you can see in actual fact, there are two uh, smaller lymph nodes near this area that is less easily apparent uh, on the CT scan. Before everyone races off wanting their PET CT scan, um, it should be noticed that PET CT is not available at all centres. Um, us here in Palmerston North usually need to send people down to Wellington uh, for Pacific Radiology to undertake them there. And unfortunately, we are limited as to who fulfills criteria for a PET scan. PET scans themselves do have some pitfalls which you need to be mindful of when interpreting them. Sometimes we'll find that things light up on the PET scan, but they are not lymphoma. Uh, and this is what we call a false positive, where you get a positive uh, scan, but it's not actually related to lymphoma. Uh, and um, in this scan here, you can see there's actually quite a lot of um, activity, fluorescent activity on this scan. And that's because this is someone that has brown fat and brown fat is quite metabolically active. So it takes up all the glucose. Um, and these scans can be quite difficult to interpret in people that have brown fat because you uh, obviously aren't wanting to interpret all of this as being lymphoma. Sometimes uh, PET scans won't light up even though lymphoma is present. Uh, and we will call that a false negative scan. Um, and um, on this image here, there's actually a mass sitting in here that's not lighting up uh, at all. And it should be noted that in low-grade lymphomas, there are higher numbers of uh, lymphomas that are not likely to light up on a PET scan, uh, which is different to high-grade lymphomas, where most high-grade lymphomas will be what we call PET-avid. Uh, some uh, low-grade lymphomas uh, will be PET-inavid. We will often, in addition to doing a scan, also uh, do a bone marrow biopsy because there can be low grade involvement within the bone marrow that you will simply miss on a CT, CT scan. Uh, and a bone marrow biopsy, what we're wanting to do is to get within uh, the marrow itself here. Uh, and so it's usually done from um, the pelvis uh, back here. Uh, and the idea is to introduce the needle through that outer core of hard bone into the marrow itself uh, and take the sample from here. Uh, this is what we call a trephine biopsy, and this is a bone marrow uh, sample here. Um, and it looks a little bit like sort of an apple core, uh, really, um, that gets taken out of the marrow. Um, and this is it being uh, taken from the microscope slide into some formalin. Uh, this will then go off to the lab and be processed uh, and they will be able to uh, ultimately cut it paper thin uh, and uh, put it onto a microscope slide and stain it. And that's what this uh, is here as a sample of trephine biopsy. And uh, there's these little pink uh, ribbons that run through the sample um, and they are the uh, sections of bone itself, this sort of structural bone. Uh, and then in the background, there's all these millions of dots, and those are all the different cells. Uh, in addition to that, there's these little white hollow areas here, and that's fat cells. Uh, so the, these samples will uh, be sectioned uh, and looked at under the microscope. And very much like the original biopsy sample, you can do those staining techniques on it uh, to try and pick out different cells that may be present. Once you've determined uh, what the lymphoma is uh, and where the lymphoma is, you can then make a decision about how best to treat. Um, and there are a number of different ways that low-grade lymphomas may be treated. And that ranges from just watching and waiting uh, to using radiation, uh, to using uh, chemoimmunotherapy, 
uh, up to the level of stem cell transplants. Uh, and if we just look at some of these in a little bit more depth, um, active monitoring is also called watch and wait. And because many people with low grade lymphoma won't even run into any problems with their lymphoma, um, they may never need any treatment uh, at all. Um, and we know that getting in early uh, with a low grade lymphoma uh, doesn't change the overall outcome with the lymphoma. And I guess this is something that's often quite difficult as I think as a society, we're educated that we should seek out prompt medical attention for uh, symptoms that we have and that uh, time is of the essence uh, and early treatment is really important. And that's not the case uh, often in, in low-grade lymphomas, where in actual fact, because these are growing so very, very, very slowly, they may never grow to a point uh, where they're actually going to cause someone any trouble whatsoever. Uh, and so for a number of people, we uh, undertake active monitoring, which is where we want to keep an eye on things, so that if it looks as though things are changing, um, that we can get in and start treatment early, but that we're not starting uh, earlier than we actually need to. Uh, need to. Radiotherapy uh, can be used, and radiation's best for um, people that have just local areas of disease. So for people that have uh, stage one or stage two disease on the whole, uh, because in that situation, you can use the radiation to cover the whole of the disease. Um, where people are stage three or four and they have disease on either side of the diaphragm, the field with which you would need to treat is too big and that leads to too many side effects and problems. Um, radiotherapy has come an awful long way um, and um, back in the 1970s, uh, the field uh, of radiation uh, was quite big and you can see this sort of yellow area, uh, which would have been the whole area that they would have been uh, using to treat what is just this area of disease here in blue. Uh, and um, they, in the 1990s, um, used uh, more modest fields uh, and now moving forward, we're using involved site uh, um, or involved node radiotherapy. Uh, and the fields are, are, much, are much smaller. And that's really important because what we're wanting to do is deliver the radiotherapy to the lymphoma, but we're wanting to spare any other uh, areas uh, from the effects of radiation. So in particular, uh, we would want, be wanting to spare the great vessels in the neck, we'd be wanting to spare the heart from the effect of radiation, and we'd also be wanting to spare the, um, the lungs uh, as well. Um, Chemoimmunotherapy is also um, relatively newer on the block. Uh, certainly chemotherapy has been around for a long time. And chemotherapy works on stopping cells from dividing. So we know that lymphoma cells are cells that uh, are dividing too quickly from what they should be. Um, and traditional chemotherapy uh, targets cells that are dividing and stops them from, from doing so, and thereby stops cancer, cancer from growing. There are a few pitfalls with traditional chemotherapy in that the cells need to be dividing. Uh, and in a low-grade lymphoma, often the cells are dividing very, very slowly. Uh, so sometimes they're not as sensitive to chemotherapy as some of the lymphomas that are growing very, very quickly because you have a lot of the cells that are just sitting dormant. Um, the other thing is um, it's not just lymphoma cells that are actively dividing in the body, but there's a lot of other cells which are also dividing. We continually replenish um, all our blood cells from our production from our bone marrow. Uh, our white blood cells are continually being replaced sort of every you know, five days or so, we're gonna get a brand new lot. Um, and um, likewise, our mouth and our gut cells are continually replacing, um, and also uh, hair cells, taste buds, um, uh, and most cells within the, in the body will be ultimately dividing uh, and replenishing themselves. And so they will also get the um, effect of traditional chemotherapy, and hence the number of side effects that sort of occur with the more traditional chemotherapy drugs. 
Immunotherapy is uh, where uh, we form antibodies uh, to cancer cells, essentially. So um, in a infection, um, our immune system uh, will develop antibodies that uh, attack uh, uh, little uh, what we call antigens uh, or little molecules on the um, virus surface. Uh, and that then triggers the immune system uh, to kill off these cells. So immunotherapy is where drugs have been developed uh, which are antibodies uh, but they uh, stick on, not to viruses, but onto markers that are on the surface uh, of uh, our lymphocytes. And the, um, probably the one that's been around the longest is rituximab, uh, and that's an antibody uh, that binds onto CD20, uh, which is present on B cells, uh, and therefore also present on B cell lymphomas. Um, and binding of this uh, rituximab uh, then stimulates a whole lot of things from the immune system to occur, uh, including um, complement activation uh, and uh, cell death as a result. And so for many uh, chemotherapy uh, regimens, uh, there's now a combination of both our traditional chemotherapy drugs, uh, but also uh, adding in immunotherapy drugs such as rituximab uh, as well. Uh, just so that you get that combined uh, effect. And I think the future is going to be moving more and more away from using traditional chemotherapy drugs uh, towards looking more at trying to target our malignant population of cells. So just targeting the lymphoma cells. Um, and there are a number of these drugs uh, already available uh, and already under study. Uh, and they look at targeting uh, different different aspects uh, of the cell. And I guess we've already sort of spoken about rituximab binding here onto CD20. Uh, but there's also uh, um, certain enzymes that are active within uh, B lymphocytes or lymphoma cells, which can be targeted. Uh, there's various uh, expressions of proteins that the cell may express that help it from uh, evading normal cell death. Uh, that we can uh, target and switch off. Uh, there's various other ways with which we can um, activate the immune system to target these cells directly uh, and kill them, kill them off. Um, and so I think for lymphoma in general and, uh, and for low-grade lymphomas, I think the future's really bright. I think there's a lot that's heading our way, uh, which is really going to change and improve the way uh, that uh, lymphomas and low-grade lymphomas are treated. And I think some of the main things that I, we can expect to see coming are a better understanding of uh, lymphomas, of their underlying genetics, um, and that's going to allow us to sort of subdivide lymphomas uh, more uh, and find out what in particular subtypes are vulnerable to which particular drug. Um, and uh, there's now next generation sequencing that allows us to look at lots of DNA within uh, the cell uh, to determine abnormalities. And I think uh, we're going to be seeing increasing use of that. And I think also those targeted drugs are gonna be coming forward um, and providing better ways with which uh, we can treat lymphoma cells and reduce some of the uh, more traditional uh, side effects that we've seen with the traditional chemotherapy drugs. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Alana. Very, very thorough. And we do have some questions coming through. Uh, so let me just pull those up. So someone has said, can you talk about the maintenance use of rituximab for B cell marginal extranodal lymphoma after initial treatment with bendamustine and rituximab? And actually that same person has put through some extra information. 
I should add, I had a tumor in my lung, uh, pleural effusion stage 4A, six cycles of BR has resolved the tumor in effusion. So I guess with treatment is we often break it down into induction, uh, which is where we're trying to induce a response and reduce a remission. Um, and maintenance, which is where we are trying to stop it from coming back. So with follicular lymphomas is they are difficult to cure. Uh, and those that need treatment because they're causing problems will go through induction. But it's anticipated that in time they may reoccur later, either in the same location or elsewhere. And to try and um, prevent the lymphoma from coming back too soon after treatment is we would use maintenance treatment. Uh, and uh, in maintenance, we need to be using uh, drugs that are well tolerated because uh, we don't want to expose people to ongoing side effects uh, of treatment. Uh, and the drug for low-grade lymphoma that uh, has been most studied as far as maintenance goes is rituximab. Uh, and rituximab is often used in combination with induction, uh, but after induction, uh, there is, can now be a maintenance phase. And it's only really probably in the last, or oh, might be six months uh, or so that we've actually had funding for um, rituximab maintenance. Uh, and usually for rituximab maintenance, uh, the rituximab is given as an infusion uh, every two months. Um, for uh, two years. Uh, and what that has been shown to do uh, is to uh, extend out the time frame uh, before the lymphoma may return. Uh, and uh, rituximab maintenance can be used uh, in any of the low grade lymphomas, uh, both uh, marginal zone lymphoma uh, and also um, in follicular lymphomas or the other lymphomas. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question here, Alana, about um, transplants. Could you make a comment on with how you choose between a transplant with your own cells or donor cells? Sure. So um, transplants are intensive um, and they have a lot of side effects associated with them. And so in follicular lymphoma, we are most often the lymphoma is going to respond to um, traditional uh, standard treatment. We wouldn't go down a transplant route uh, because then we expose people to side effects uh, and risks that actually they didn't need to be exposed to. So it's about sort of choosing the right amount of force to get a good result from the lymphoma, uh, but trying to minimize the sort of side effects and the toxicities of treatment. So. Uh, for lymphoma, um, we sometimes consider transplant where the lymphomas come back uh, rather than the upfront setting, just because we've got so many other good options to use in the upfront setting. Uh, with um, transplants, there are two transplants. There are self-transplants, uh, and the, which we call auto for self. Uh, and then there are transplants where a donor's cells are used, which are called allogeneic transplants. Uh, Self-transplants are really a way of providing a high dose of chemotherapy. I've mentioned how chemotherapy uh, will have a lot of off-target side effects, and in particular, um, it will uh, impact on the bone marrow's ability to produce blood cells. Uh, and so there's sort of a maximum level of traditional chemotherapy that you can use. Um, and what we're doing in a self-transplant is to take out some bone marrow stem cells, hide those in the freezer, provide high dose treatment, and then recover the bone marrow and the blood cells by bringing back the bone marrow stem cells that can then recover the blood counts and repopulate the, the cells out in the blood. So essentially a stem cell transplant using your own cells as a way of providing high dose chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, as I say, we uh, sometimes do that in uh, relapsed uh, lymphoma, um, particularly with follicular lymphoma. Um, and um, I also sort of touched on mantle cells. Sometimes we'll use it in mantle cell as well. Allogeneic transplants are slightly different. What they're doing is they're using um, donor, donor cells. And 
um, it gives you the ability to provide high doses of chemotherapy, but the difference is it's also giving you another immune system as well. So I always like to think about the development of cancer as being two, two, you know, two heads. One is that you've had a cell that's become abnormal and turned into a cancer cell. Um, so you've developed a bad apple, if you like. The second thing is that your immune system hasn't noticed that and got rid of the cell at an early stage and allowed it to grow. So in an allogeneic transplant, what you're doing is not only giving chemotherapy to kill off lymph the lymphoma cells, but any that escape that chemotherapy, you're actually giving an alternative immune system that will go along and remove any bad apples. So um, it's really like introducing um, a policeman uh, into, the, into the environment or, or a teacher that's just going to continually prevent relapse from happening later on uh, as those bad apples uh, uh, reoccur. The problem is, is that the um, alternative immune system will recognize not just the lymphoma cells as being foreign, but the rest of the person as well. Um, and so while we talk about graft, graft is the donor cells uh, versus lymphoma effect, which is what we're wanting. We're wanting that uh, the alternative immune system to attack the lymphoma cells. There's also graft versus host. Um, and that's where the alternative cells, uh, the alternative immune system, start to attack uh, the recipient. Uh, and that can lead to a whole host of problems. Uh, it can attack skin, gut, uh, eyes. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of extra side effects uh, and extra toxicities that go with the allogeneic transplant. And so um, where that might be used is in people whose lymphoma hasn't responded to the other methods you've had available um, that don't involve those, those toxicities and those risks. Thank you for that answer. Uh, next question. Any research for low-grade lymphoma where any dietary supplements or regular foods that can keep lymphoma simmering for longer and not needing treatment? Yeah, um, not that I'm specifically aware of. I do think diet's important. Um, I do think us being as healthy as possible uh, with robust immune systems as possible uh, is going to help. Um, whether there's anything in particular uh, within our diet outside of just healthy living, I'm not really aware of. I guess sometimes those things are really difficult to study as well. And so some of the research um, is pretty low, low level evidence. Um, it takes a lot to study lymphoma and it takes a lot in particular to study low grade lymphomas because people do so incredibly well with them. If you're going to introduce something new, you need to follow people up for a really long time anyway to detect whether or not what you've done has actually made an improvement or not. Um, and so some of those things um, aren't well studied. And I guess it's fair to say, um, and I probably sound pretty cynical here, is financially um, it's expensive to run a clinical trial and um, it can be difficult to fund that level of research into dietary things. So potentially there's things out there that work but aren't well studied. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, as a younger patient in my 40s, watch him wait right now, but if I ever need treatment and knowing that drugs are becoming gentler, uh, will tablets and things, I think she means with tablets or things, is it best to go with the heavy duty IV chemo if offered a choice or a gentler drug? My thinking is that it could relapse after that and save the gentler drugs for when I'm older, etc. Yeah, I guess um, there's a lot coming. Uh, and I think uh, for people who can currently watch and wait, continuing a watch and wait um, is, um, is the best thing because there's more and more on the menu card. Uh, the longer we wait, uh, the more drugs will be available. Um, I guess what's, um, once you come to making a choice about treatment, um, it's about asking about what the level of evidence is for things. Um, some drugs are try, you know, there's evidence for upfront. Some drugs there's evidence for at relapse. 
uh, and um, you know, for lymphomas that may need repeated treatment over time, then sometimes the decisions that you're wanting to make up front uh, might, might be that you're wanting to hold something in reserve. So I think very much uh, at the time of any treatment, it is worth considering, well, what are the options in front of me now? Uh, and what are the options available for the future? That's not necessarily to say up front, go big guns, um, uh, because I, I think increasingly we may find actually there's better treatment options even with those lower intensity treatments is that the uh, response rates uh, and the duration of responses uh, may be very similar to the more intensive things. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, how do BMAT results influence treatment uh, slash management? Okay, so um, by I'm assuming that's uh, bone marrow um, aspirates and, and uh, bone marrow uh, biopsy samples. Um, if the bone marrow is involved, then that will change the stage. Uh, and so um, it may mean that options such as radiotherapy, where you're just targeting local areas, aren't going to be suitable. So certainly where you're thinking about using uh, radiation treatment uh, alone without any chemotherapy, you want to, be, want to be reasonably clear that you're not leaving areas of disease untreated. Uh, and because the, um, the CT scan or the PET scan in low-grade lymphomas won't necessarily tell you what's happening in the bone marrow, you are reliant on actually doing a bone marrow sample. The other thing is it's nice to know what you've got to start with so that you can then make certain that all the disease is responding as well. So um, if there is involvement in the bone marrow, it's nice to follow that up and make certain that that clears as well. Sometimes if things aren't responding as, as you may wish, um, then there's always the option of changing treatment to get a better response. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we've probably answered this, but I'll ask it in case you've got something else to add, but does uh, stem cell transplant ever come into play as treatment for indolent lymphomas? Uh, yes, usually more at the relapse setting uh, than upfront treatment. Okay, great. Uh, next question, do you have any tips for watch and wait? I find it hard to trust myself to know when the lymphoma is progressing because I couldn't even tell that I was sick when I was first diagnosed. Are there things I should be looking for? Any little fever and I start worrying? Yeah, I think that that's incredibly common. I think some people find that it's not watch and wait, it's watch and worry. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's hard, I think, to re-establish your serenity about your health um, after you've had a scare uh, and had that concept, my body's let me down um, and I now need to be on guard against it. Um, and it is really difficult to fall into um, the right zone uh, where you're not over responding and you're not under responding. Um, I think it is important to get on and live life, uh, but not to ignore things. Low grade lymphomas develop sort of slowly. Uh, and so um, I think um, it's reasonable if a symptom develops, it's just to wait and see what might happen with that. Infections develop quickly and they respond quickly. So often lymph nodes will come up, um, particularly in response to infection, but then they settle really quickly, where a lymphoma lymph node's not going to settle. So I think if you sort of put your hand on something and think, oh gosh, you know, um, I, I've got a bit of a snuffle and I've got a little small, small lymph node in my neck, might be reasonable to say, well, I might just see what happens over that, keep a, a feel on it uh, over the next, you know, week or two and just see what's happening about that. Certainly lymph nodes that are growing really rapidly, that's different, but small uh, lymph nodes, it might be reasonable just to keep an eye on it. Um, and I think particularly if you've got other symptoms of being unwell, coughs, colds and sniffles, it's reasonable sometimes just to sort of wait and see um, what might happen with that. Great advice, thank you. And a lot of patients will be, um, will be keen to hear that. So another question, can you have subcut uh, rituximab maintenance treatment administered under public system or only through private care? Is it Pharmac funded or only Pharmac funded for IV administered? Yeah, so um, in the public system, only intravenous rituximab is funded. Um, and that is because subcut rituximab remains under a patent uh, and so is um, considerably more expensive still. 
uh, and hence whilst it is a lot quicker to give, unfortunately it's only in a private setting where that can be given. Thank you. This may be our last question. Um, I'm on watch and wait with CLL diagnosed one year ago and first annual blood test in a month. What numbers should I be looking at? How much data do you need to assess how indolent it is? As a follow-up, when would you recommend to push for additional tests, FISH and TP53? Sure, okay. So um, I think there's a few aspects to that. Um, uh, CLL um, is often very, very indolent. Um, and um, when should you push for additional tests? I think if there's new symptoms that aren't resolving, uh, that might be the time to think, well, you know, uh, the reason for those new symptoms because of the CLL. Um, TP53 is something that can be acquired uh, in CLL. So testing early um, isn't an, um, and finding it positive uh, isn't necessarily an indication for therapy. Uh, and finding it negative doesn't necessarily mean it will remain negative. So um, uh, international guidelines um, are clear that we should withhold TP53 um, uh, assessment until uh, treatment. Uh, and we should probably also be testing it uh, at time of relapse as well. Uh, and that's become particularly important within New Zealand because of some recent funding changes of what drugs might be available in patients that do have a TP53 mutations up front. Um, just read that question because I think there's a few other things I've missed off that. So, sorry, just bring it up again. Um, what numbers should I be looking at? Uh, how much data do I need to assess? Sure. So um, with um, CLL, um, it's actually, whilst everyone focuses on the number of CLL cells out in the blood, it's actually other things that will uh, be the indication for therapy. Uh, and that's uh, if the red blood cell count's falling and, and someone's becoming anemic. Uh, it's that the other normal cells in the blood are, are falling um, and people are dropping their platelets which clot their blood or people are developing big lymph nodes um, that are, are large and bulky and becoming uncomfortable. Um, I think uh, for CLL, it's similar to uh, the question that was posed before uh, with that watch and wait, is um, watching and waiting where you can, I think at the moment is a really good strategy because I think that there's going to be newer treatment options funded uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully, which um, I think are gonna be really excellent treatment options. Um, so um, I think CLL, uh, like other low-grade lymphomas, it's really good to, to monitor those things, but I think watch and wait's actually a really good strategy um, if, um, if there's no indication for treatment. Wonderful, thank you. And sorry, one more question's come through. We'll make that the last one. Uh, for Wardenstrom's patients, do you have any comment re relative expected remission periods for R bendamustine and R chop? Um, so um, um, R chop, uh, R CVP, and R bendamustine are the most common immunotherapy. Uh, regimens uh, that are used uh, in low-grade lymphomas. Uh, sometimes in Waldenstrom's we'll also use a regimen called RCD. Um, and there were two uh, big trials um, called the BRIGHT and the STILL trial uh, that compared um, RCVP, RCHOP as one group uh, versus uh, rituximab and bendamustine as the other group. Um, and they showed that really the regimens are equally effective uh, for both those um, uh, treatment regimens. Uh, Arbendamustine does tend to um, be slightly more tolerable um, side effects wise. It doesn't cause hair loss. Uh, it just generally seems uh, to have lower rates of infections associated with it. Um, the trials then sort of subdivided into sort of this, the different individual subgroups. Um, and um, overall, just you know, even separating into subgroups, um, the outcomes were pretty um, similar uh, between those regimens in all the subgroups. 
Um, I think uh, certainly our preference here in Palmy is usually to use rituximab and mendamustine um, up front uh, rather than RCHOP RCVP on the basis of those trials. Um, Sometimes with Waldenstroms, you know, there are a few other sort of uh, treatment options available as well, and it's all going to be very dependent on individuals um, as well. Um, and um, I, I think it is a matter of uh, when you're making treatment decisions as to, um, you know, get really clear information about what are the options, uh, what did the studies actually show, um, and also whether there's any other aspects either about your lymphoma or about your general health which might make your case slightly different to perhaps what the trials might have done yeah wonderful well I think we might leave it there thank you so much Alana it's just been amazing there's so much content there that I know patients who couldn't make it today will be thrilled to, to re-watch um, and thank you very much for taking that time to answer patients' questions as well. We had a few messages through just thanking you for a wonderful presentation um, for your time and for giving an answer to all of those questions. So it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'd also like to finish by saying thank you very much to everyone for joining us uh, today. We will be back next Friday as our series continues at the same time. Next Friday's talk is actually on transplants. We've got Dr. Clinton Lewis talking about on stem cell transplants of the when, why, and how. So um, please register if you're interested in that. And thank you again, Alana. I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you so much right. for your time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.